The joy on kids' faces at bringing in money is infectious, but teaching them how to give away their resources because God gave it first to them is out of this world. When I see kids giving of their money, uh, giving of their generosity, they run to the offering plate. Money that kids are bringing through VBS is going to Water for Good, and it's going to transform the village in Ethiopia that has about 4,800 people, specifically the kids, uh, because the VBS money is going to build latrines in their elementary school. Chapman Street Church. I am Skana from Water for Good. Currently, I am in Dodola, uh, Ethiopia. Your compassion and care will support and uh, bring positive impact for numerous lives like these children with access to safe water, improved sanitation, and enhancing health and education. May God bless you all. Thank you very much. We love you. We're here at Chapel Street. We want to be a church that is for our community and for the world. We want to be a church that serves the world. And one of the ways we do that is through generosity. So as many, many of you know by now, we have uh, chosen a project this summer to give toward a Serve the World project called Water for Good, uh, providing uh, sanitary conditions and water in a small village in Ethiopia. Uh, as you saw in the video, our VBS kids have already gone ahead of us in the last couple of weeks and bring in their nickels and dimes. And by the way, I, was, uh, I visited Thursday morning right here to watch VBS. And how many of you are serving right now in VBS? Uh, a bunch of you. Well, thank you so much. That's an amazing thing you're doing, providing for our kids and the kids of our community. What a fun morning. But the kids do run up to the front and they give, and they've already given over $6,000 uh, toward our goal of $150,000. There's a whole other week of VBS to come. So I want to ask us all and challenge us all to step up and follow the lead of our VBS children in giving towards Third World. This is just above and beyond giving, just to be generous, to bless this community in Ethiopia. So to do that, you can go to our church website or go to our app or just write on a check, STW, serve the world, drop it in the in generosity, generosity boxes. And everything we raise over the next few weeks will go to this project with Water for Good. So thank you very much for that. I also want to welcome those of you who are watching our online service. So glad you could join us from wherever you are. And I also want to say something to our 11 a.m. service today. By the time you see this, I'm going to be on the road heading down to Indianapolis to catch up to my wife, who's already there helping our son and our daughter-in-law prepare for the arrival of our next grandchild, um, which is, thank you. Now, of course, it's their baby, but it's our grandchild, so we're going to go down there. So thank you to our tech team for making it possible for me to get out a little earlier today. So let's begin. When I was about five years old, my dad was a pastor of a small church in Valley Station, Kentucky, which is just about 30 minutes south of Louisville. Here I am with my mom and dad. I'm only about two there. Uh, we're standing on the front steps of that church. I notice I'm wearing my pants a little high there. <laughs> but in those days, um, our church had both a Sunday morning service and a Sunday evening service. Of course, our family was at church in both services. So one of my memories, a foggy memory I have, of being at that church, which would have been like 1958, 59, 60, right around in there, was when the evening service ended, um, I, along with a couple of other little boys in the church, would just run around the church like crazy uh, as our parents visited with each other, just burning off all that stored up energy for being in two church services in one day. 
And sometimes we would go out to the back door of the church if we got there with no one looking, and we could go out outside into the little parking lot that was behind the church. Now, there were two things about that little parking lot that made it dangerous for a five-year-old boy. First, it wasn't very well lit. may not have been lit at all. I remember it being dark outside the church after Sunday evening service. But secondly, the parking lot was not paved. It was made of gravel. And I brought some gravel here today. So now, a little side note. I believe that um, every little boy is born with uh, two genetic predispositions. One is a fascination with fire. Uh, that's why as grown men, we build fire pits on our patios and have grills on our back decks. The other is to throw things. See rock, throw rock, and that's why we play baseball. Anyway, there were all these gravel uh, stones out in the back parking lot of the church, and so we naturally picked them up and threw them. We all had all this stored up energy, and we'd throw them as high and as far as we could out into the darkness of the night. And the most fun thing was that sometimes when we threw these stones out into the darkness, they just disappeared. They made no sound at all. But other times, uh, they would just make the coolest sounds. Like bang, bong, crack. It never dawned on our five-year-old brains that there were cars parked out there <laughs> in the back parking lot of the church, cars driven by our parents, cars that belonged to church members who paid the salary of my father. Now, it, I don't think it's related, but it wasn't long after that my, my dad left that church and took another church, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Now, today we're going to look at a, another story about rock throwing, and we're in the fourth week of a summer series we're calling Face to Face Stories of Meeting Jesus. Now, my wife and I are currently uh, trying to catch up to the current new season of The Chosen. Anybody watch The Chosen here? Any Chosen fans? Well, we are fans of that, and in a recent episode, the Jesus character, played by Jonathan Rumi, explains his ministry by saying, I make people what they aren't. I make people what they aren't. Now, that exact line is not in the gospel record. You can't find a verse that has those exact words in it, but I think that's what the gospel is about, and that's what our summer series is about. And so far, we've looked at the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, where Jesus offers her the living water of eternal life. We looked at the man who had been an invalid for 38 years, uh, the healing at the pool in John chapter 5, where Jesus says to him, do you want to get well? And then he heals him. Last week, Pastor Jeff, who, who today is preaching at South Street and at North Aurora, preached about the, the cleansing of the leper, how man came to Jesus full of leprosy, and Jesus touched him. Touched him and made him clean. Now, each one of these stories has been different. Uh, some are stories where Jesus pursues a person. Others are stories where people come to Jesus in desperation. So they're all the, different in some way, but they're also all the same. Because in each story, Jesus makes people what they aren't. Today, we look at a familiar story. You'll recognize it, my guess is, from John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. Now, a little bit of background. If you look in your personal Bibles, you know, either today or later, and you look at John chapter 8, you'll see this little note in tiny little print that says something like, the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have John 7:53 through John 8. 11. You might wonder, what, what does that mean? Well, it just means that basically um, as the ancient documents, ancient manuscripts were collected uh, from the very earliest centuries, and are actually fragments of the Gospel of John that, that go back to the late first century, um, as they were putting these together under the guidance, we believe, of the Holy Spirit, that scholars, they weren't quite sure who wrote this story up. And they weren't quite sure where it belonged in, in the documents, but they were very confident that it's a, a genuine, original story from Jesus' life and ministry. Now, what is interesting is that some of the early church fathers in the second and third century were very uncomfortable with this particular story because they thought that somehow it made Jesus look bad, like he was uh, condoning blatant promiscuity, but I think we're going to see that it actually makes Jesus look exactly like what he was and is, which is the Lord of both grace and truth. Now, in chapter 7, 
the, the chapter immediately preceding the story we're going to read, we see that Jesus is in Jerusalem for one of the great feasts of the Jewish calendar, the Feast of Tabernacles, and he's been teaching day by day in the area of the great temple. Large crowds have been coming out to hear him, but at the same time, uh, the religious leaders of the time are becoming more and more concerned about what he is teaching and what he's saying about himself and what he's saying, frankly, about them. And they're actively seeking to discredit him or to find some reason to arrest him. Now, let's jump into the story. I'm going to read uh, John 8, beginning in verse 2. You can look on the screens or in your, your own personal Bible. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, now these were the theologians and religious leaders of the day who prided themselves on their knowledge of the law of Moses, Ten Commandments, and on their own virtue and righteousness. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. Well, our preaching team uh, this week, and we meet every uh, Tuesday morning, early in the morning, uh, all of us together. We talk over each passage and the outlines and so forth. Uh, Pastor Joe Scavato uh, said, as he presented his outline, uh, this whole story reminds me of a courtroom scene, he said. There's an accusation, there's a defense, and there's a verdict. And I thought he was right, so I'm giving him credit for the outline I'm going to use here today. The story begins with a brutal accusation, a brutal accusation. So uh, my dad left that little church in Louisville eventually and took a church in Akron, Ohio. Uh, the new church had a paved parking lot, so that wasn't a problem. Uh, but we did live in a house with a gravel driveway. Uh, and because my dad knew me and my, my urge to throw rocks when I saw them, he made a rule, a very serious rule at our home, no rock throwing. In the yard, front yard, backyard, or driveway. No rock throwing. But one day, I was, um, when I was about eight years old, I was out playing in the street with uh, one, of my, one of the street friends named Bobby. He was a bit older than me, maybe 10 years old or so, and he was kind of the ringleader of kids on our block, kind of, kind of the coolest kid, the toughest kid. We were just playing, just he and I. And out of nowhere, he says, I bet you can't throw a rock over your garage. We had a detached garage at the end of the driveway, um, and I knew I could throw a rock over the garage. I was playing Little League Baseball at the time, was starting to be a pitcher, and the garage was about as far away as home plate is from the pitcher's mound, so I knew I could do it. Uh, but I also knew the rule, no rock throwing. But Bobby had challenged my throwing prowess. He challenged my ability. He challenged my very identity. And I wanted to impress him, so uh, in a split second, I picked up a small stone, wound up, and let it fly, high and as far as I could. Did I tell you that the garage had a little window in the, <laughs> in the door? Small window, six inches by six inches, one window, right in the middle. Who does, who puts a window in a garage door? But it was right there, and that stone hit that window dead middle, shattered it. I couldn't have done it in a hundred tries. I did it on my first try. So I broke the window, I broke the rule, and I was in trouble. And then my friend, Bobby, says, I'm telling. <laughs> He's the one that challenged me to do it. I said, no, 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 please don't tell my dad. 
<laughs> because I'm not supposed to throw rocks. He says, what do you give me not to? So I ended up giving him all the money in my piggy bank. I'm not messing this up. I'm making this up. I still remember. 96 cents. <laughs> and just not to tell my dad. Now, it means at eight years old, I was already the victim of extortion in my life. <laughs> I'll come back to that story in just a minute. Verse 3 says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of of adultery. Now the accusation here is the sin called adultery. A clear violation of the seventh commandment of the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. A sin so serious it was considered a capital offense in the ancient world of Israel. In Leviticus chapter 20 we read, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death, usually by Stoning. So the woman is clearly guilty, but also quite clearly there's something else going on here. Let me read again with a little emphasis. Verse 3. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman, a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now, there are some questions we need to ask here. And the first question is, where is the man. man, right? The law of Moses says that both the man and the woman are to be punished. So to bring in only the woman is a violation of the law of Moses in itself. And how exactly did they manage to catch her in the act? Ancient Jewish law required at least two witnesses, and often three, to accuse someone of a sin that demanded capital punishment. And the witnesses couldn't just see a man and woman going into a room or a man and woman coming out of a room. They had to observe the very sin. So either this is a fabricated accusation, which in itself is a serious sin. The ninth commandment is you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Or it's just an elaborate setup with the woman as a pawn in an effort to trap Jesus. The woman stands accused, but her accusers aren't really concerned about her. They aren't concerned about her sin. They aren't concerned about the condition of her soul. They aren't conditioned, uh, concerned about her confession or her repentance. They aren't concerned about her really at all. In fact, she's not even a person to them. She's the thing to be used. What they really care about is setting a trap for Jesus. Now, before I get into all that, there are a couple things here we need to see about sin. Sin is real. We live in a world right now, our current culture doesn't like to talk about sin, doesn't like that, to use that word at all. In fact, acts like sin doesn't really exist. You know, you do you, I do me, we're all cool. But we, we kind of know what it is. We just prefer to see it in somebody else rather than in ourselves. But from cover to cover, the Bible tells us that sin is real and sin matters. In fact, that's the whole point of the gospel. That's the whole point of the cross because all sin eventually destroys. And quite often, maybe most often, sin begins in private. We have this tendency as human beings to, to say to ourselves, well, no one will ever really see. No one will know about the broken window. No one will know. But sin has this way of eventually becoming known, becoming public. And all sin, the Bible says, brings guilt, shame, and death eventually. But what's really going on here is more of a trap. Going back to the end of verse 3. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. So the religious leaders have been looking for a reason to discredit Jesus or maybe even to arrest him and now they've set the trap because there were two system of law, systems of law in the land at that time. Rome ruled everything. So Roman law uh, ruled the world, that part of the world. But the Romans also allowed the Jews to have their own law 
their own religious law and so forth, uh, but the Roman law was superior. So the Jewish law said that adultery was punishable by death, usually by stoning. Roman law said that only Rome had the authority to execute the death penalty, and they usually did it by beheading or crucifixion. So if Jesus said, don't stone her, they would immediately accuse him of disregarding the law of Moses, being unfaithful to God. But if he said, yes, go ahead and stone her, they would immediately report him to the Roman governor, who at the time was Pontius Pilate, for violating Roman law. And on top of that, they would have destroyed his reputation as being the friend of sinners. So they aren't just putting this woman on trial, they are putting Jesus on trial. So they've accused the woman in order that they might accuse Jesus. And then Jesus offers a brilliant defense. There's a brutal accusation, and now there's a brilliant defense. In our country, in the United States, we have a system of government, I mean, a system of justice, I mean, where every citizen is guaranteed certain rights. Guaranteed the right to a public trial before an impartial judge, the right to legal representation, uh, the right to defend ourselves from any accusation. So at any trial, there's both a prosecuting attorney and there's a defense attorney. And perhaps the most famous trial in my lifetime was the trial of ex-football star and media personality O.J. Simpson in 1995. I know, almost 30 years ago. How many of you remember watching that whole saga play out? Okay. So if you were at least 10 years old in 1995, you no doubt remember the whole country being fixated for weeks on what was called the trial of the century. And you might remember that many legal experts believe the turning point of that trial came in the closing arguments of defense attorney Johnny Cochran when he pointed to the glove presented as evidence against Mr. Simpson and said, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Now, in this story, Jesus offers a different kind of defense. Verse 6, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. So the trap is set. The religious leaders have a guilty, sinful woman. They claim to have the evidence of eyewitnesses. They have the law of Moses and they have law, the law of Rome. They have Jesus right where they want him. But then Jesus does something they could not have anticipated. He stoops down and begins to write on the ground in the dust. And by the way, this is the only time in the gospel record that Jesus writes anything. We aren't told what he was writing. There's speculation throughout the centuries. What was he writing? We don't really know for sure, but I think we can make some educated guesses. Because there are only three other times in the Bible that I know of where we are told that God writes. First comes in Exodus chapter 31 when we read, the Lord finished speaking to Moses on, the, on Mount Sinai. He gave him the two tablets of the covenant law. That's the Ten Commandments. The tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Remember that. The second comes in Daniel chapter 5, the story of the handwriting on the wall. Ba uh, pagan Babylonian king Belshazzar is holding a great feast. We read in Daniel chapter 5 that suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote in the plaster on the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Then they called Daniel, who was a Hebrew living in captivity in Babylon, to interpret this message. It turns out it's a message of the coming judgment of God on the sins of Babylon. There's a third reference in Jeremiah chapter 17 where the prophet writes, Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. In the very previous chapter, John 7, Jesus referred to himself as the source of living water. And here now he writes in the dust, almost as if he is reenacting the words of the prophet. So, 
It makes sense to me that Jesus likely is writing something that both reminds the accusers of God's law and warns them of their own sin. Because then he stands up and says, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone at her. Now I want you to notice what he does here. Jesus agrees with the law of Moses. That is, that there, a sin has been committed and the sin deserves punishment. But he challenges the accusers now to become the executioners on one condition, that they be without sin themselves. And then he begins to write in the dust again. So my best guess is, and this is just me, you can find plenty of scholars who think that maybe other things are going on here. But I think Jesus may have been writing out, sketching out the Ten Commandments, the law of God. To remind the accusers that they are also law breakers at some point in their lives. Maybe he was also writing down the specific sins of the scribes and Pharisees, the religious folks. Pride, lust, greed, envy. Maybe he was writing down the names of the men in the group who were actually guilty of the same sin of which they are accusing this woman. And I say this because of what happens next, verse 9. At this, those who heard, some versions here include the phrase being convicted by their conscience, began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. It says they heard. Now that word implies that Jesus' challenge cut them to the heart. And then they began to go away one at a time, the older ones first. This is a little interesting detail why the older ones first? Now, again, we don't know for sure, but a good guess might be because the older men had simply lived longer lives and had more time to collect their own guilt and law-breaking. So the woman is on trial. Jesus is on trial. And his defense is not to proclaim her innocence but rather to confront the self-righteousness of the accusers. And in this way, Jesus puts the accusers on trial. So we have a brutal accusation, we have a brilliant defense, and the story then leads to what I'm calling a beautiful verdict. You go back to my broken garage window just for a moment. Uh, my friend, friend Bobby, uh, kept his side of the deal and my 96 cents, and he didn't tell my dad. When my dad asked if I came home from work, he asked, he saw the window, he asked me if I knew anything about the broken window. I said, no. I lied to my dad, which made me more guilty, but I was in the clear now. Sort of. Fast forward about 30 years. Yep. I'd long since moved away from home, gone to college, found my calling, got married, had children of my own, but that, that broken window and that lie still troubled me. Still troubled me. And I was driving my dad in the car at some time. I don't remember if he was visiting us or I was visiting him. We're in a car somewhere, and I just, I thought it just felt it was time. I needed to get that off my chest. I needed to, I needed to confess. And so I said to my dad, kind of out of nowhere, hey, um, remember we lived in, in Akron, and remember that we had the house with the detached garage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you remember that time the garage window got broken? He was a little confused. I needed, to, I needed to say more about it for him to remember. And then he said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I vaguely remember. I said, well, um, I threw a rock and I broke it. And then I lied to you about it. He was quiet for a bit, and then he said, yeah, I figured it was you all the way along. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, I forgave you for that a long time ago. So his forgiveness was always there. I just didn't live in it. Verse 10 says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now I want us to see a couple of things here. First, 
Notice that Jesus speaks directly to this woman. No one else in the story has spoken to her. They've spoken about her. Jesus speaks to her. Woman, where are they? Now, this sign sounds kind of stiff and formal to us. Woman, we, w- we wouldn't begin a statement like that. But in that day, in that culture, that was a term of tenderness and respect. Like, ma'am or miss. It's the same word he used to refer to his own mother on multiple occasions. Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, at anyone, at any, anyone reading the story at this point, whether you know it's from the Bible or not, and there are plenty of people in our culture who will say, don't throw the first stone, who don't know the stories in the Bible. Whether you're a Christ follower or a skeptic, anyone would agree right here, this is a beautiful ending to the story. This is a beautiful ending. Jesus forgives a condemned and sinful woman. You can feel the relief, the fear of punishment removed, the weight of shame and condemnation lifted. It's beautiful. But I want you to see here that Jesus actually makes two statements back to back. He says, neither do I condemn you, which is a statement of grace. It's the gift of forgiveness. And by the way, he's making a statement by himself too, that he has the authority to forgive sin. Then he says, go now and leave your life of sin, which is a call to discipleship. It's a call to obedience. Jesus doesn't just spare this woman's life, which he does. He doesn't just forgive her, which he does. He wants to transform her and change her life going forward. Now, I think it's the story's here because we all need both. We need grace, forgiveness, and transformation, change. And it's the order that matters here. And notice grace comes first. Jesus forgives this woman before he calls her to a transformed and changed life. And how often we get that backwards. Here's our problem with grace. We have this tendency to think that we have to earn it that we can earn it. We think we have to deserve it, that we can deserve it. We think others have to earn it too, and others have to deserve it too. Therefore, we don't actually experience it, and we can't offer it to others. Grace is an undeserved and unearned gift by definition. He gives her what she cannot earn and does not deserve. And it's more than just being nice. Grace is being fully known, fully loved, fully forgiven. It's a power that shatters everything about who we are, who we have been, and then remakes us in the image of the one who loves us. Grace comes first, then the call to transformation and obedience. So let's try to find ourselves in the story. Have we said all the way along that these personal stories in the Gospels are there for us to know something about Jesus, but also to know something about ourselves, to find ourselves in the story if we can. So maybe, maybe you can see yourself a bit in the accused and condemned woman because we've all broken a window somewhere. We've all stood accused somewhere, been ashamed somewhere. But Jesus makes us what we aren't. Because as Pastor Sam Albury says, there is more grace in Jesus than there is sin in you. There's more grace in Jesus than there is sin in you. Or maybe you see yourself in the accusers, the ones holding the stones, Because we all have this tendency to throw stones. Now, we don't in our culture throw literal stones anymore. We throw invisible stones, emotional, spiritual, or judgmental stones. We throw stones at those who are just not like us sometimes, that look 
different than we look, that dress different than we dress, that believe differently than we believe, that behave differently than we behave, that vote differently than we vote. We throw stones, invisible stones, at those we see as wrong or more sinful than we are, those who don't deserve grace, those who don't deserve forgiveness. And we act, this is the culture in which we live. We live in a stone-throwing culture. And as accused and accusers, we stand before Jesus, who just says, drop the stones. Just drop them. He says, I forgave you for that a long time ago. I can make you what you aren't. I can make them what they aren't. Just come and follow me. Paul describes this in, Rome, in Colossians chapter 2 when he says, When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, literally the written record of our debt, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. So see that? Jesus is the one who knows us fully, who sees us as we are, who sees our sins public and private. But he did not come to condemn. But rather, he came to nail our sins to the cross. In Jesus, all the stones are dropped. Does no one condemn you? Neither do I, he says. Now go and leave your life of sin. Bow with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you today for your word, for this story that begins with such ugliness and ends with such beauty. Remind us again that in some way we are all like that woman. We've all sinned. We've all sinned against you. We've sinned against others. And we stand accused. But you are not a stone thrower. You did not come to condemn, but to save. And may we know the power of your grace that makes us new, and may we learn to offer it to others as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.